I'm not making the claim that gold is the best investment in terms of return. It isn't. But I believe that it is the best asset class in terms of making a choice between keeping large amounts of your wealth in dollars or having some of that in gold. That's the point that I'm trying to make. Give us a brief sort of uh, recap course, so to speak, on the main critical drivers that affect gold. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, first of all, to clarify, I am a market technician, meaning I use charts and mathematics, but I also look at the underlying fundamental events that are moving the market, and that's called a hybrid technician. And right now, there are a couple of things that are definitely affecting gold pricing. First and foremost is the inflationary rate with the CPI coming in just recently at 6.2%. Now, that's a level we haven't seen in 31 years since November of 1960. And it's easy for most Americans and actually globally, although there's different levels of inflation around the world, when they go to a gas pump or they buy food, uh, they can see that those prices have skyrocketed. In fact, one of the big news stories out here is that the cost of a Thanksgiving dinner will be the most expensive one ever. So inflationary rates, because traditionally gold has remained one of the best, if not the best ways to preserve wealth in terms of the fact that if you get an inflated currency, gold will kind of keep up with that and you'll have a, a power, a net power gain or not, meaning that gold will go up as inflationary pressures go up to kind of match that. And I used to tell a story during lectures about that, and I'll try to do it very, very quickly. But if you had a $20 gold piece and a $20 bill back in the 1800s, you could have a, a, a weekend in the plaza, buy a new suit, have a steak dinner for that $20 gold piece or the $20 currency bill. Now, take it to the modern day. If you wanted to go to the plaza in New York and stay there for a weekend to have a steak dinner and buy a new suit, you could take that $20 gold coin, no numismatic value attached to it. It's worth, you know, $1,800 plus. You could buy a suit. You could get a room at the hotel and you could buy a steak dinner. The $20 bill would basically buy you a cup of coffee. Over time, gold has maintained the ability to keep up with inflation. So that's one of the first primary things that you want to acknowledge and watch very closely. Secondly, because we pair gold against the dollar, dollar strength or weakness has a 100% negative correlation with gold. If the dollar gets higher, gold has to go lower to that extent. And then the differential is whether there's buyers or sellers in the market. Those are the two key elements that you wanna look at. If you go a little bit further, you want to talk about national debt, whether we're running a deficit, whether our debt is growing, whether we're printing more dollars, because that has a effect on it. And then lastly is GDP and economic growth, because the idea behind flooding an economy with cheap dollars is that it really, it, it, it puts the GDP on steroids, so to speak. And we saw that in the second quarter of this year with a GDP over 6%. Yeah. That's very strong. Typically, we get one at what, 2 to 3% overall GDP for a year. Because of Delta, um, we had a 2% GDP in the third quarter. And so that was very, very alarming. That, I think, is, is somewhat transitory because the world is moving out of the pandemic stage, hopefully, and it's beginning to normalize. And no one's really sure what that new normal will be. But the most important thing that I look at is we've done a lot of fiscal stimulus. The, the Treasury has worked with the public in terms of sending out checks. And most importantly, the administration has been providing huge amounts of uh, liquidity in terms of fiscal stimulus. 2020 was $4 trillion plus, this year in the trillions again. And so my concern is at the end of the day, when all is said and done and we are at some sort of a new normal, what effect will this massive amount of spending and the increase of the national debt and the increase of the Federal Reserve balance sheet, which I believe 
is in the neighborhood of $8.6 trillion, what effect that will have on the overall faith in the U.S. dollar, Mm -hmm. and most importantly, the dollar value itself. So those are really the... hmm? Okay. Uh, Yeah, sorry. The most important factors... Um, okay, so let's uh, let's take a pause there. Let's uh, recap what you just said because you brought up a lot of important points. So inflation, first and foremost, you mentioned that this Thanksgiving could be the most expensive one. I wonder if anyone's done like a turkey to gold index. That would be kind of fun. But the, uh, that's, uh, the higher the turkey price, the higher the gold price. But more importantly, your underlying message is that gold has preserved value over time. And you brought up the example of the $20 bill versus... Uh, versus the gold coin. It is true that okay. gold has preserved value over the last 100 years, per your example. But if you look at other assets, real estate, stocks, the S&P 500 over time has also grown tremendously versus the dollar. So if you were to take, let's say, um, you know, let's say four units or 10 units of the uh, of the broad market back in the 50s and, and, and sell those 10 units today, you would still be able to afford a lot more than you could have back in the 50s. The point is, why are we picking specifically gold as as an ultimate inflation hedge? There are other things that have also grown in value over time. Excellent question. The way I look, <clears throat> excuse me, the way I look at it is there have been a lot of asset classes that have absolutely outperformed in terms of profit what we've seen gold do. Absolutely. If you look at the cryptocurrencies in terms of speculative endeavors over the last couple of years, it's had the greatest return. It's the wild, wild west, so to speak. But nonetheless, you know, to watch something go from 15,000 to 50,000 in a period of a year, year and a half is incredible. Before we continue, help us clicking that YouTube like button and subscribe now to our channel. This shows the algorithm that you valued this information. And it helps us spread that message. Sharing is caring. And now, let's continue. U.S. equities have been on a roar for years now, years Mm -hmm. with very small dips in between. And real estate prices have risen consistently. You can go back hundreds of years in terms of how it's risen. I am not saying that gold is going to be your most favorable investment in terms of return. What I am saying that in terms of wealth preservation, in terms of keeping a lot of money in the bank in dollars versus having a good percentage of that either in physical gold, sometimes paper gold, but physical gold, I think I like the best. There really isn't anything out there that will preserve your wealth. There are asset classes that have been consistently outperforming gold. And that's why most economists, most economists um, are under the assumption that you should have a percentage of your portfolio in gold. Now, one thing about the U.S. equities is at any point, they can become overheated. They can sell off briskly and you can have large declines. So we haven't seen that type of activity for a couple of years. I'm not making the claim that gold is the best investment in terms of return. It isn't. But I believe that it is the best asset class in terms of making a choice between keeping large amounts of your wealth in dollars or having some of that in gold. That's the point that I'm trying to make. Okay. Let's talk about uh, gold as a store of value. I've asked this question to actually the crypto folks. Um, We're not here to talk about crypto, but I like to just apply the same principle to gold. So I've asked the Bitcoin holders whether or not they feel comfortable storing um, a portion, a large part of their savings in Bitcoin and just leave it alone for 10, 20 years. Don't trade it. Don't touch it. Just Make that your savings account in 20 years, revisit that Bitcoin wallet and and whether or not they would trust that wallet to have grown in value over that 20 years. I get various responses. Let's apply the same logic to gold. Let's say for the sake of argument, all gold, leave it alone for your kids or grandkids or whatever. And in 20, 30 years, would you trust that account to have grown in value vis-a-vis other assets? Absolutely. The key with gold uh, vis-a-vis or in relationship to currencies globally, not just the dollar, is that after World War II, we had a, a thing called Bretton Woods and that we began to go off of the gold standard, but we had kind of a revised gold standard. Although individuals couldn't buy or sell gold, uh, you could take U.S. currency if you were a government, turn it into the government in the United States and they would ship out gold. In 1973, Nixon put a nail in the coffin. And if you look at any chart, historically speaking, 
that there were two points in which gold really took off. The first point was in 1933 when Roosevelt confiscated all the gold from individual citizens and made it illegal to own. And they did away with the silver and gold certificates, meaning they're redeemable for gold or silver. And so we saw gold, which was sitting at $20 for a couple hundred years, rise. He, he actually took the price to $35. And then it slowly crept up, but we were still on a semi-gold standard. Once the gold standard was abolished, we had a new term for currencies, fiat currencies, meaning... They are backed by nothing except the faith you have in the government. It's now a promissory note. It's not something redeemable for an asset. And that was the game changer. My sense is that from what we've seen over even the last 20 years in the way the United States is spending more money than it makes, the national debt continues to swell. If we run down that same course 20 years from now, gold will definitely have more value than it does now. Intrinsically, it's an asset that does have, or it's an asset that intrinsically has value and it will always have value. It's had for thousands of years, but no longer are governments backing their currencies with any kind of hard asset, whether it was a basket of commodities or gold or silver, which was the, the benchmark that most countries used to, to print currencies and coins. It only came later on when they started printing bills and those bills were redeemable for gold. And so that all changed. And when that changed, the entire formula of gold and currencies changed forever. Do you want to know one thing about crypto? I made over 3000% in profit in a few weeks. Fact is, the traditional financial system, the traditional money system makes you poor, not rich. If you want to earn $500,000, $1 million, you have to wait until you're 50, 60, 70 in the traditional financial system and you probably will still be broke and you will be old. This is not a sexy combination as you can imagine. But the question is, how can you start in crypto and make these profits? Where to invest? Where to start? My name is Gunnar and I'm from Germany as you can hear and things are a little bit different in Germany. More about that later on. The fact is, there are lots of different cryptocurrencies. It's a gigantic universe where beginners and professionals get easily lost. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. There are seven key steps you need to follow to become successful in this market. You have to know them and if you fail one of them, it's literally impossible to succeed in this market. Just an example, one of the key points is your exchange and one of the biggest are for example Binance and Coinbase. These are trusted and well established exchanges but, and this is a big but, you won't find the super profitable coins on those exchanges. The unknown super profitable coins that get gigantic profits are not traded on those kind of exchanges. They are traded on much smaller insider platforms that are barely known. And I can tell you what those super secret exchanges are and why they are so profitable. And another super important thing are the right information sources. The point is, the internet is gigantic. There are hundreds and hundreds of YouTube channels, blogs, pages and much, much more. And there are also market makers and influencers. For example, Elon Musk, he is not a crypto guy. But the moment he recommended Dogecoin, it went through the roof, to the moon, so to say. But why did he recommend it? Where did he hear it from? He didn't hear it from newspapers. And believe me, he is listening to someone. But you have to know who and you have to react before he is reacting. This is really, really important. And these are only two of the seven steps you have to follow in order to be successful in crypto. And if you want to know all of these steps in much more detail, and if you want to have a comprehensive checklist, here's what you should do. There is a link below this video. Click on this link and you will get the opportunity to subscribe to my channel. Click on the link and you will see a video where I explain the next steps. So see you soon. Click on the link now. I'll see you there.